Um, so, so there are a lot of different ways that we can actually think about, talk about the ways in which feminist movements have had a major role in the various Arab uprisings and subsequent to those in the ways in which the Arab uprising actually has played out for women. Feminism is absolutely a political movement. I mean, you've heard of the saying, I'm sure the personal is political. Everything that happens in the home, in the street, and in the presidential palace is all connected to feminism. I say that what we're fighting against in the Middle East and North Africa is a trifecta of misogyny. That trifecta of misogyny is the state represented by Mubarak in the palace, the street represented by Mubarak on the street corner, and the home represented by Mubarak in the home. So the state, the street, and the home together oppress women. Because, we're, you know, and this is where this idea that women's issues must wait. Um, I think it's really important, first of all, actually to mention the fact that in every single instance of the Arab uprisings, what you saw was huge presence of women. So, for example, in the ranks of the Egyptian revolution, the Egyptian uprising, you saw women. In the early stages of Syrian uprising, before um, you actually had the armed groups taking over, women had an enormous presence, writers, intellectuals, artists, activists. Um, in other instances, women also had a huge uh, impact, which has not been written about. So, for example, in Yemen, which is quite a conservative place, uh, some of the most famous demonstrations were of women. And in fact, the Muslim Brotherhood in, uh, in um, uh, Yemen had its most visible figure being a woman who ended up, Tabakko Karman, who ended up getting a Nobel Prize. In Bahrain, again, women have this, played this enormous role. And all of these women would consider themselves feminists. When we talk about revolutions and uprisings, people often only think of the strictly political uprising against the state. They say the state oppresses everyone, men and women, so really no one is free. So why are you talking about women's freedom? No one is free. I say to them, yes, the state oppresses men and women, all of us, but the state, the street and the home together oppress women specifically, using a, a, a toxic mix of religion and culture. So when you look at the countries, various countries in the Middle East and North Africa, you will see Activists who are fighting against the state, for example, by creating quotas to ensure greater representation for women in Parliament. And in Parliament, we create legislation, which has an impact on everybody. We see women who are fighting against the Mubarak on the street corner. In Egypt, and I'm sure that you will identify with this in India, we have very high levels of street sexual harassment. What you euphemistically call Eve teasing, which is sexual assault. We have incredibly high levels of sexual assault in Egypt. And in the run-up to the revolution and since the revolution, we've seen a plethora of women's groups, feminists, who go out onto the street and directly challenge this idea that a man is entitled to public space and a man is entitled to a woman's body. We also have feminists fighting a very, very political and personal fight against the Mubarak in the home. That is the dictator who imposes a curfew just on girls and women. That is the dictator that promotes and propagates harmful traditional practices such as female genital mutilation. And that's a dictator that uses religion to make women obey him and to suit his advantages. Um, many of them revolutionaries. And so for them, those two things were inseparable. Not in the sense that you sit there and you think that what I'm doing is for women, but realizing that any kind of proper political social transformation would inevitably affect women's role. Now, the effect of the counter-revolutionary movement across the Arab world um, has been uh, very different in different places. In some places it has had a very notable, terrible impact. When you look at, for example, Syria or Libya or Yemen, uh, inevitably, when you have these civil wars that destroy households that send out millions of refugees across, you have a very tangible and real effect in uh, the social indices that indicate women's condition. So women lose out on education, women lose out on healthcare. They're often married off early in order to save them from the possibility of violence. Um, they're often displaced. Um, and, and in Syria, again, Syria, Libya, and Yemen, these transformations have been notable. But I think in other places, what you also see is uh, a very substantive transformation in the way in which women actually organize themselves and respond to the counter-revolutionary movements. I think Egypt is a very good example of this, because what you saw in Egypt was that uh, one of the strands of the counter-revolutionary movement was actually to try to drive women out of the squares. And, the, and this happened through two different means. One was a very formal mean where the military actually had virginity tests for the women they arrested. 
So they instituted a virginity test. This, of course, is if you are arrested as a woman activist, you don't want uh, military men to go poking and prodding uh, in your genitalia in order to prove you're a virgin or not. And the second was a much more informal one, and it's not very clearly understood, but I think it's quite significant, of uh, sexual harassment on the streets, which was intended, again, to scare women and drive them into, into the house, uh, into their domestic spaces. I think what has been pretty extraordinary is the way in which the same activists that were at the same feminist activists, men and women, who were at the forefront of the demonstrations in 25th of, 25th of January and in all the subsequent months, the same activists started organizing anti sexual harassment uh, groups. And what is interesting about these anti-sexual harassment activist groups, not NGOs, but activist groups, is their profound awareness that what they're doing is not just about gender. It is all, it's also about militarization. It's also about the ways in which the state sec security apparatuses is trying to consolidate its power, and it's doing so on top of women's bodies. Um, and I think that part of the reason that this, to me, the, the organization of these women, into uh, women and men, into these uh, anti-sexual harassment activist groups is quite a significant moment is because it is very clearly and in a very thoughtful and grounded way marrying the issue, uh, the issues close to feminist hearts to questions of state responsibility for violence. I think this is really hugely important. What feminism ultimately is, for me, if you ask me the definition of feminism, it's equality and justice. And when we get equality and justice that guarantees that half of society is not oppressed for the sake of the other half, Ultimately, that is to the betterment of everyone. As the black American feminist Audrey, uh, Bell Hook says, feminism is good for everyone. Feminism is for everyone. Many people falsely believe that feminism means women will be on top and men on the bottom because they're using the patriarchal model. Patriarchy promotes men on top and women on the bottom. This is not what I want. I want equality and justice. So unfortunately, because of patriarchy and misogyny, men can only think of movements that want to liberate women i.e. feminism, as something that will hurt them. No, I, I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't hate men. I don't want to oppress men. I want equality and justice for women, which ultimately is equality and justice for everyone. You also see women's roles in lots of other places. You still see women being at the forefront of the activist movement as spokespersons, for example, for the for the uh, Bahraini revolution that was suppressed by uh, through Saudi intervention. Women are very, very uh, major presences in uh, in in the sort of faltering uh, subsequent post post revolutionary Tunisia. Um, one of the things that I was struck by is that in Libya, which is suffering from extraordinary violence of the civil war, there are groups of women emerging as union activists, as feminist activists, who are actually trying to bring together, trying to say, no, the kinds of regional and, uh, and uh, militarized divisions that have emerged in the aftermath of the Libyan counter-revolution are one that women should counter as, as women who are, again, union activists, feminists, and revolutionaries. And I think that those kinds of transformations are also in a time which is profoundly grim, actually, for the region, where you see huge amounts of violence, where you see that counter-revolution trying to consolidate its force. It's a pretty exciting moment to actually see also these glimmers of hope which emerge through feminist activism. I'm not entirely sure that feminism gives them the skill to organize. I think the skill to organize is something that you learn through organizing. And you, you learn through organizing not only because, of, because you're a feminist, but you learn to organize because you are, for example, in Tahrir Square and you want to ensure everything from the protests going well to people not dying from suffocating on tear gas to people having food to eat to people having medicine to eat. And so those forms of organizational skills emerge in that particular setting or having consensual forms of decision making, for example. So I think that those kinds of skills emerge not necessarily out of a feminist ideology, but also because of, but because of these transformations. Um, should I stop? Or sh I think let me just finish and then you can talk to her. Um, but I think that in the sense of, I, I think that's a brilliantly eloquent way of discussing it, where the diction matters. And I think a diction of egalitarianism, of social justice, are profoundly significant for that kind of social justice movement.